Unplugged in, the giants of Earth running for their lives, illegally hunted for their ivory tusks. We collectively, as humans, should be concerned and should be saddened by the fact that these majestic creatures are being killed for their ivory. Travel deep into the forests of Gabon with VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb documenting the work of U.S. Special Forces to help protect the elephants. Oh, it's very clear when you're around them that they're extremely emotional and very, very sensitive. They mourn their dead. We have footage of them. Plus, actress Kristen Davis on her work raising awareness of poaching for ivory. Unplugged in, protecting the elephants. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren, reporting from Washington, D.C. Wildlife protectors say more than 20,000 African elephants are killed by poachers every year. In the Zambezi Valley of Zimbabwe, the elephant population at the UNESCO World Heritage Site shrunk from 20,000 to 12,000 in the last 20 years. Gabon is home to more forest elephants than anywhere else in the world. VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb embedded with a group of U.S. Special Forces that went deep in the forest to train Gabonese anti-poaching soldiers working to protect the remaining elephant population. Here's part one of her documentary. Overwhelming power. Overpowered by greedy men. Willing to kill for their ivory. We've been shot at. We are now in war. What's at stake is the future of Gabon. If we don't beat the poachers, Gabon will go the way of CAR. We will lose our country. In this tiny Central African nation, park rangers called Eco Guards man the front lines. And the U.S. military has answered their call for help. We not only help them preserve the wildlife, but at the same time, we're disrupting criminal organizations and we're helping them develop a better future. There's a hill here, maybe. Donk. And then this is coming up. So what Donk. does that mean for the objective? Donk. VOA is the first news media outlet to embed with the U.S. military on a counter-poaching mission. We followed a small army team to see how American training and resources are strengthening the Rangers. In some of the parks, they already are a, a true paramilitary force. They're having gun battles about once a month. This is the fight for Gabon's forest. I eat everything that gorillas eat. What's it taste like? This tastes like, um, it's like, it's like cucumber, I guess. For biologist Lee White, the nation's minister of forest, Gabon yes, is a paradise. Yes, uh, when you see elephants walking out onto the beach in Luango, and then, then you see a humpback whale breaching in the background, then you think to yourself, is this real? Yeah. But that's Gabon, that's what Gabon is like. Gabon is home to more forest elephants than anywhere else in the world. But over the past couple of decades, they've been killed by poachers by the tens of thousands. Tragically, we've lost about 70% of the forest elephants of Central Africa in the last 15 years. But between Gabon and Northern Congo, we're the only places that are really hanging on. Gabon's vast rainforest cover almost the entire country, making it a perfect home for the African forest elephant. Unlike their cousins that thrive in the savannas of Eastern and Southern Africa, forest elephants of West and Central Africa are smaller, with straight tusks rather than curved ones to better maneuver in dense trees and underbrush. Female forest elephants do not start breeding until they are more than 20 years old, leading wildlife experts to estimate that it takes more than 50 years 
for the species to double their population. According to the World Wildlife Fund, poachers kill at least 20,000 African elephants each year for their tusk, despite a ban on international ivory trade. Forest elephants have been hit the worst. The World Wildlife Fund's biomonitoring report indicates there are now less than 10,000 forest elephants in Central Africa. DRC, CAR, and Cameroon have all lost more than 90% of their forest elephant populations since 2011. Gabon and Congo now hold Africa's largest forest elephant populations. Gabon's elephant population is down about a third, a blow that's been lessened due to increased resources for conservation. I had about 100 staff, I had no cars. So managing 13 national parks in a country the size of the UK with no cars is quite a struggle. It's a hitchhike to get to the parks. And we went from a budget of um, about $500,000 a year to $25 million. Since 2007, Gabon's national parks have grown from about 100 eco-guards on the payroll Allez. to more than 850. Parce que pour faire un travail comme celui-là, ça demande beaucoup de, des efforts physiques, ça demande beaucoup de sacrifices et il faut beaucoup de motivation. Nous avons le devoir aussi de pouvoir préserver cet écosystème, cette nature, cette biodiversité pour les générations futures comme ceux, nos prédécesseurs, donc nos anciens, nos anciens parents. VOA was the first media organization to embed with U.S. Special Forces countering elephant poaching. I spoke to Carla Babb about her experience and the impact of American resources on the effort. Carla, I know all your work for VOA at the Pentagon, but now this mini doc on elephants. Why? Well, I was actually speaking with some military officers back in December of 2016, way back then. And we were talking about all the activities that the U.S. military does in Africa. And I said, now, I bet you guys do some really cool things. A long conversation, we decided uh, we, we decided that counter poaching was something that nobody was talking about, and the U.S. military is actually helping out with. They've been helping out since 2009. Two, three, four, five person teams that go out there to help uh, with the counter poaching activities. But it's been going on, it's been in Tanzania, Uganda, Botswana, Chad, Malawi, and obviously Gabon. So why is the U.S. military involved? When you think of the U.S. military, you think of fighting extremist groups and training military teams on how, you know, rule of law and how to shoot their weapons. But this is something that various African nations have asked for. And so they understand that the U.S. is one of the largest international funders to help with wildlife preservation there. And they know that they need to be more professional because uh, as one of as one of the people that I was speaking with says, you can't just go up to a poacher and say, "Excuse me, give me your gun." <laughs> you have to be prepared to fight them, and you can't fight them unless you have a plan to capture them, a plan to push them out of the parks. Is there a particular type of elephant that was in this area that you were protecting? Yes. So Africa actually has two different types of elephants, and people outside of Africa don't always know this, but there's the savanna elephant that most people are used to seeing. Those are the massive elephants with, that are in the savannas. That's why they're, they're named the savanna elephants. And then there are the smaller forest elephants. And they have you know, straighter tusks so they can maneuver around the brush. They're smaller so they can maneuver in the jungles in the forest. And those are the elephants that they're trying to save in Gabon, in Congo. What happens if you get caught uh, killing an elephant and trying to take its uh, tusk? So that's something that's still being discussed. They're trying to put stricter laws on the books. For a long time, it was just you, you were put in prison for a few months and then you were released. Uh, they're trying to make a, uh, the laws a lot stricter. And Lee White, who was the minister that I was speaking to, said that they were being that was being very effective because they're trying to get across that this is necessary for Gabon to survive. Did, did the elephants um, ignore you or did they find they were they threatened by you or just spying on you? What, what was your sort of your interaction with these elephants? I had this one encounter with a mother and a baby. And that was the one time where the park ranger said, there's a baby. We're far enough away to where she shouldn't worry. 
but you don't want to start charging or walking quickly or making fast movements towards them. That was the only time where I felt that there was going to be any sort of conflict. And then, of course, we were out too late at night and one came right in front of our vehicle. <laughs> uh, is there a way to sort of describe the poaching in terms of, you know, is it, uh, you know, how prevalent is it? Is it uh, go going down, going up? What, how do you describe it right now? They say the poaching is decreasing. The problem is these elephants take a really long time to reproduce and to double their population. Case in point, you look at the surrounding countries and they've lost 90% of their elephant populations. They waited till it was too late. They didn't put in the resources. And now the elephants have moved into Gabon and the Congo. And Gabon has, has been very proactive on this. And you have to hand it to the Ministry of Forest for being so proactive on this and saying, we don't want this to happen in our country. Did you shoot this yourself or did you bring a crew? It was just a two-person team. It was myself and my videographer, Ricky. She was fantastic. Uh, we had to, we were early risers and going to bed very late every single day. Uh, but it was a really neat experience. And so she would film the majority of the stuff. And then I filmed a little bit on my iPhone so we could get a couple of different angles. We had another VOA Africa reporter that had been in Gabon the year prior, and I used some of her footage. She was in another one of the parks, then Kebe National Parks. So we were able to work together to, to share footage that way. Well, it's a fantastic documentary. Um, and, and one other thing is the, the, uh, the elephant. What a magnificent uh, animal, isn't it? I had seen elephants before in Sri Lanka, but I had never seen them out in their natural habitat just walking around. And, and that was fascinating to me. And I'll never forget that. And it, it's really motivated me. Once you see the elephants and see how majestic they are, you don't want them to disappear. It's amazing how it came together in the midst of a global pandemic, in the midst of everything that has been happening this year in 2020. And I'm, I'm really proud of the team that we've had. Carla, thank you very much. It's a great documentary. Thank you. Challenges over resources, along with violence and illegal gold miners, have threatened even the director of the heritage site. And the park's open borders with Congo and Cameroon complicates the effort to protect the elephants. Here's part two of Carla Babb's documentary. Il y a les voies des humains à 15 km où je vois des coupes de machettes fraîches très loin. Là, je suis réellement en danger. Yeah, that, the, the level of violence has been rising the last five years or so. Until about five years ago, we'd never had any be shot at. Now it's commonplace. We had some illegal gold miners who were also doing poaching tried to kill our technical director, Huber Hilary Koga, a couple of months ago. He went into a camp and they immediately opened fire on him. You know, it's a war. I am talking about band of 20 to 50 people in the forest with AK-47, four, five, every fall, three, three, seven, five rifle. So it's complicated in forest. Minkebe National Park is considered the most dangerous post for eco-guards. Bordered by Congo to the east and Cameroon to the north, poachers flood the park and escape capture by darting across the river to another country. Narcisse Baba Obame is the patrol chief there. Avant de partir en patrouille, on a toujours peur parce que, comme je vous dis au parc de Mikébé, quand vous rentrez, vous savez pas si vous allez sortir. Chez nous là-bas, Mikébé, vous pouvez vous croiser directement avec les braconniers. C'est pas, ça veut dire on a un indice, on dit il y a des braconniers à tel endroit et puis arriver. Vous pouvez marcher. Vous êtes sur une piste et vous croisez le braconnier et directement le feu est rentré. Ça arrive. Donc, pour vous dire franchement, je suis un être humain. Quand je rentre en mission, je suis toujours stressé. Mais comme c'est mon boulot et j'aime mon boulot, je suis obligé de bien le faire. Today, even some of the safest parks are under attack. The Cameroonian poachers are now at the north of Lopé, so at uh, 40 km from here and uh, on the north of uh, even the national parks. They are crossed, uh, they are, they are crossed in Quebec. They are around Minzik, 
Mindik is at uh, less than 100 kilometers from here. So this is why all the elephants are coming, going to the, to the coast, because they are afraid by these poachers. As a new day in Lope begins, this cadence brings hope because these eco guards are training to be the leaders of the counter poaching fight. And they're not alone. Could somebody brief your medical plan? A group of U.S. soldiers are here to increase their chances of survival. So generally the route we're going to take to do this patrol is leaving the Sedam, head to the main road, and then head south across this bridge. Today, the Americans have created an exercise to hunt down and capture a group of men posing as poachers inside the park. I'm ready. <laughs> Army Captain Kevin Chapla leads the team. But if an injury does happen in real life, all the training stops. So I would just advise you guys to watch where you're stepping. There, we've seen like giant snakes down there. So if you get bit by something, just bring it to our attention and we'll, we'll proceed accordingly. So right now our, our training patrol has, they're about 200 meters from the objective, the suspected camp of about four poachers. Uh, and from here, they're probably gonna send out a recon element, see what they can see, come back, develop a plan, and then, uh, and then raid the, the suspected poaching camp. Oh, mais les gars sont U.S. led counter poaching training operations like this one began in Tanzania in 2009, officials say, and U.S. military efforts started in Gabon in 2018. Our core mission really is to build the capability of our African partners through training. So anything that is criminal in nature has the capability to have linkages with violent extremist organizations and impact uh, the, the ability of the, the government to get the critical programs and development to the people uh, wherever they may be at. Months of training has improved techniques to capture poachers and preserve evidence. And first aid training is in high demand as poachers push deeper into Gabonese land. Conservationists in Zimbabwe say it has been 12 months since an elephant was killed. They say a drop in tourism because of pandemic travel restrictions has not resulted in an increase of poaching there. Actress Kristen Davis is dedicated to inspiring change and raising awareness to stop illegal poaching. I spoke to Kristen about her work with the Wildlife Trust in Kenya. Okay, Kristen, who is Chaimu? <laughs> Shaimu is actually an elephant that my friends and I found who had been orphaned um, in Kenya. And we were um, on a, uh, with an ecological group, a conservation group, and an elder, a Maasai elder came out and said, oh, a baby elephant is lost. And everyone knows that they can't survive alone. And we spent a few days searching for this baby elephant who was terrified. This is in 2009. And finally we found her and we called the Sheldrick Wildlife Trust because everyone in Kenya knows that they know how to raise baby orphaned elephants and re-release them back into the wild, which of course is so important. And luckily she ended up there, we got her there, and she now lives back in the wild in Kenya in a national park. Where was Chaimu's mother? What happened to her? She was probably killed. We never found her body. It was right near the border with Tanzania. And in 2009 is when the elephant poaching crisis rose again. We had dealt with it in the 70s and 80s. And then um, because of the complicated thing with CITES, the International Board of, of uh, Wildlife Trade, there was another kind of uptick where people realized they could make money on the illegal market by selling tusks. So there was a really huge crisis. And again, elephants were almost completely extinct at one point. So we are on the upswing from that. Is she still at the at the uh, at the uh, wildlife trust? Is she still there? She's in the wild now. They get to decide. The elephants decide themselves when they're ready to go live back in the wild. It's kind of a process. So she moved from the nursery to kind of the intermediate rehabilitation center, which is out in the in the huge huge national park called Savo. And then eventually, she's a very plucky girl, my Chimo. Very very. Uh, headstrong, and she and her friend Kiliguni, whose tail had been bitten off when he was alone by hyenas, 
uh, their best best buddy, and they went out into the wild together. But they come back and they visit their human family uh, often, especially during the dry season, because they know they can get water from the trust. And the trust also has a number of anti poaching teams that monitor the park to try to keep them safe once they're living in the wild. One of the things I read is that scientists are unsure, but they think that the elephant may weep, and the, that an elephant grieves, an elephant cries. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Oh, it's very clear when you're around them that they're extremely emotional and very, very sensitive. They mourn their dead. We have footage of them. Um, if the bones of a, of a loved one are there, they, they stand for days and touch the bones, and you can see their, their they have tear ducts and and sometimes it means they're excited it can mean a lot of different things to see the kind of it looks like they're crying but they do that also if they're happy so you can't always know but if they're touching the the, the bones of their loved ones and and feeling those feelings you can pretty much tell that they're mourning i mean just being around them even you can feel a, a lot of of their feelings um they communicate in a in a vibration that we can't hear but we can feel so sometimes when you're around them, you just go into this kind of meditative state that that you know you're you're feeling all of their communications. It's very magical. You know, they're the most magnificent, beautiful animals. And so now I want to turn to the question that that's very upsetting to me: poaching. Uh, where where is you know what's the story with the poaching now in Kenya or in, in Africa with these elephants? Is it has it pretty much been stopped or is it raging again? So unfortunately, poaching is still happening in an illegal way, mostly. Uh, though there has been a lot of success, like for instance, Kenya, our poaching in Kenya, I think it's down, I want to say 40 or 50 percent. And that's because of a private public partnership. And America has actually been very helpful in terms of we sent people from our wildlife fishing game and our State Department to the ports in Kenya to help educate them about uh, find, being able to track and find these illegal shipments that were happening. So um, because of the private-public partnership, it's really come down a lot. But I don't know that the government could have afforded to basically wage a war, you know, which is what it is like, um, by themselves. So it takes the conservation groups, which is, of course, funded by people like us, uh, hopefully, when we can. And um, then there's countries like the Congo, where because of the unrest, they really are um, just on the front lines. I mean, I would say every other month, ranchers are killed. It's it's tragic. These people are giving their lives to protect these animals, the gorillas, elephants, all of the wild animals, and, and they're being killed. So it's not ended. Um, it's different in each country, depending on the government and what they're able to do and the unrest you know, that, that may crop up. So unfortunately, it's not over everywhere. It, you know, so many of us, um, you know, love elephants, but you know, we actually owe a lot of gratitude to the to the uh, Sheldrick Wildlife Conservation Trust. What, what? How did they come about? Well, Daphne Sheldrick, uh, who is in heaven now with 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 her elephant friends, I'm sure, um, really pioneered raising baby elephants who had been orphaned and re-releasing them into the wild. She had no degree; she just loved the elephants. Her husband. Uh, the late David Sheldrick, was the warden of Savo, this huge national park. So the trust has been in existence over 40 years. We have re-released over, like, I think it's 260 elephants into the wild. They're now having wild-born babies. So they're mating with the wild elephants, having babies. They always bring the babies back to show to the keepers, which is like the most magnificent event. And the keepers are always so excited, like it's their grandchildren, you know. It's, it's very beautiful and so special to be a part of. Well, Kristen, thank you very much um, for talking to me and uh, actually for taking care of the elephants or helping out and putting a spotlight on this. I appreciate it. And thank you, Greta. Thank you so much for your, your giving us a platform and your, your love for elephants means so much too. Teaching the future trainers is the goal of the U.S. mission in Gabon, creating professionalism within the ranks to fight the organized network of poachers and terrorists that scar the region. Back now to Carla to show us more about this mission. Here at Lope National Park, it takes about four hours to drive to the nearest hospital. It takes even longer from some of the other parks. So for these eco guards, this medical training could be the difference between life and death. Army Specialist Omar Soto is the team's medic. Out of the past 15 months, I think I've been here 11. My goal was to basically teach them how to identify injuries that are basically 
can could potentially take your life the, the quickest. Give them the the tools to basically, or the knowledge to address um, the injuries accordingly. Unlike previous counter poaching training from other nations, Chapla says the U.S. mission with Gabon's National Park Agency, known as the ANPN, is designed to train future trainers. This small group will return to parks across Gabon, and their immediate job will be teaching their colleagues everything they've learned from the American team. It's a proof of concept for them being able to instruct their own. And in fact, it's the first uh, training sustainment capability that the ANPN has, has ever had, so it's, it's pretty big. Je crois qu'il y a un grand monsieur de ce monde qui a dit qu'il est, il est mieux d'apprendre à quelqu'un à pêcher que de lui donner du poisson. Nous aurons toujours besoin de la coopération, mais nous pensons que pour ça, euh, il est toujours, il est bon que nous ayons, nous soyons plus ou moins en commun. These eco guards are highly motivated individuals and teaching them is, it, not only is it fun, but it's easy. They're very uh, willing to learn and willing to ask questions. And as an instructor, I don't think uh, it gets any better than that. C'est une formation très riche parce que euh, en rentrant ici, on avait des attitudes un peu différentes d'aujourd'hui. On est devenu un peu plus professionnel. And they need to be professional to have a fighting chance against the organized crime networks and terror groups they're facing. We can trace the poachers who are killing those elephants back to Boko Haram. The group has terrorized Nigeria and parts of West Africa, raiding villages, kidnapping hundreds of schoolgirls, and killing thousands of people as its leaders seek to create an Islamic caliphate. As I said to the U.S. Embassy a few months ago, I say, boss, we have two solutions. We work together or we work uh, you know, on each side. But at the end, the, the attentat will be in your country, not in mine. But I, I agree they will come in my country to take ivory or money and to, to prepare this attentat. So we will have to work together. One thing not included in this mission, weapons training, something the Rangers say they desperately want. That's because until last year, the government didn't allow eco-guards to carry weapons. And most still have to rely on military gendarmes to patrol with them for their defense, role-played in the training by eco-guards carrying sticks. It's got to the point where, not in all parks, but in some parks, we have to arm the echo guards as well as the gendarmes. And I have initiated that. The president supports it. And we are in the process of, 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 of buying, buying the guns. Ça, c'est ce qu'on a retrouvé sur les braconniers, sur celui-là. Je sais pas si c'est le chef des braconniers ou pas, mais il a beaucoup de munitions. Now you, you, you can't say to a poacher, oh, sorry, guys, uh, stay quiet and give me your gun. Three, three months ago, we were not allowed to carry weapons. Now we have weapons. And the poaching is decreasing. Officials hope these changes, along with additional international training and support, will accelerate Gabon's counter-poaching offensive. But time is running out for the elephants. And it may not be enough. We're losing about two tons of ivory a month. That's about 150 elephants a month. So I'm proud that we've made the progress that we've made, but it's still catastrophic, so we still have to do more. You may win some battles, but, but the war keeps going. That's all the time we have for now. Thanks to my guests, VOA Pentagon correspondent Carla Babb and Hollywood actress and wildlife conservationist Kristen Davis for joining me on this special edition of Plugged In. Stay up to date with our website, voanews.com, and follow me on Twitter, at Greta. Thank you for being plugged in. Mm -hmm.